You are listening to the Lucha Central Podcast Network. And now, LuchaCentral.com presents Masks, Mats, and Mayhem. The other stuff. Intro, yeah, separate right now. Intro, EV. Oh, Jordan uh, reports. to another edition of Mass Mats and Ma'am. I'm your host, the Outlaw LA Reg. You can find me on social media at Justin Harvey 75. You can find the entire show on social media at MMM Show 75. That over there is oh wait, that over there is at Lucha Gringo. That up there is at Meatloaf. Meat Meatloaf? Is that what Evie Dub called you before? Me Meatloaf. Meat, meat, meat and that loaf. right there is at Byron Fever. This is our new show. You can find us on LuchaCentral.com's podcast network. You can find us on iTunes in this new stream. You can find us on Spotify. You can find us on Spreaker. You can find us but damn on it. Prisoner Hunting Grounds. And when you do find us, you better do these steps. Pretty, pretty please. So that in the future... We have super great advertisers that keep this show free and fun for everyone. So what you're going to do is you're going to find us on your favorite outlet to watch the show. You're going to rate, you're going to subscribe, and you're going to review. We need you to do those things. Do a and click. If you're, click uh, if you're doing YouTube, like. thumbs, thumbs up us. Thumbs yeah. up. You know, Remember. if you're on iTunes, give us the five stars and write us a, write us a fun review. Tell us what you like about the show. Tell us what you want to see more of. Tell us what your favorite guests are, who you want to see on the show. Tell us all of the things because we love you. You love us. We want to st stay around and keep doing this. There's one easy way to do it. And right now, that is to give us the thumbs up wherever you can. And that goes yes. for the whole Lucha Central Podcast Network. Hook us all up, brother. Yes. Yeah. Or give us our, our goal. reviews. Our goal as a podcast is to have Lucha Central work it out so that we can get one of those ball shaper sponsorships. Wow. That's so we could get good. one ball wow. shaper for the four of us. Hey, dude, you know what? It's not going to be gross until we have to send it all the way to the UK for Meef. Like, you know, if me and Justin use it, it's fine. Once it gets to New York, it'll be a little nasty. But Byron's hairy as fuck, dog. You, dude, you, know, you guys it. live in the valley. It's not going to be fine. Them. My oh, life you see what I deal with, people? You see what I deal with? This is this is what I deal with. Wow, well, well, that shirt's so pretty wet, dog. Yeah, no, right. it's not the only thing that's wet. Well, <laughs> Jesus. I got to say, though, I, I hate to bring it down because we are having a good time and this show is supposed to be fun and entertaining, but this was a, a, this was a bit of a tough week uh, in wrestling all around. We had some um, some wrestling journalists that, that left us there, too soon a few weeks ago. What's that, uh, Byron? Ray, I didn't hear you. Uh, Larry Saka. Yeah. Uh, who was the fucking man? I don't know if you guys read his stuff, but I feel like I've been reading it for years. I like, he's been well, I, time. I mean, when we first met in high school and we were making up um, luchador names and watching NWO stuff, back then he was still he was writing, and he's been one of the most prolific. Um, Internet wrestling community writers um, of all time, so much so even like this generation think, of wrestlers. I used hmm? to think he was the real Zonk for a while, and yeah. like he just liked wrestling too, but it's completely <laughs> different yeah. people. Yeah, he uh, he tragically uh, uh, passed, uh, and then um, another one from his time who hasn't written in a while, um, Chris Hyatt is. If you follow his Twitter, um, he it's weird. He's uh, he says he's on his way out because he stopped taking dialysis. So uh, he was another very influential um, wrestling writer with his mop-ups and, and whatnot. Um, yeah. Yeah. He, I always thought he was like the good version of Scott Keith. Like, yeah, so did he, I think. Yeah, I don't think, I don't know if they liked each other, but yeah. I don't think Scott Keith knew about him, but Hyatt definitely wrote about him a, a lot. Um, well, yeah. and then there, there was also the, the Hanakamura news oh, that came out. And um, I like I, I can't even find the words to say about that shit. That just bummed me the fuck out, yeah. man. I mean, and it's it's tough. Like you know, working in reality TV, I I see what some of the people on these shows go through, and I know that these are people that are are seeking attention to a certain extent. And if if you've never seen the show, there's a show called Terrace House, which is very kind of like the old school real world 
Yeah, um, it's not quite Big Brother, but it's no, like because there's not a lot of people. games and yeah. stuff. It's really just these, you know, Japanese youths kind of living together, um, and they move around every season. And it's very popular in Japan, but they also cut into it with segments of commentators kind of talking about what's happening. And the commentators and, shit on everyone. Like, well, they don't. They don't always shit on everyone. Like, if a story's cute, they say it's cute. But if somebody like, like you know, it's oh, you know, Johnny, he's being very mean to to Linda this week, and we don't know. And and it does kind of influence how people feel. And that definitely happened to her on that show. And then that extended into, you know, social media. And then you know, stuff with wrestling. Wrestling fans aren't always the nicest people in the world. I've done it myself on on the interwebs. Um, and Meefloaf and I even saw it happening to one of my favorite fighters, Jessica I, this morning. She literally put up a post that was just really excited about a main event possibility. And like the 20 or 30 comments in a row were just absolutely shitting on her, just kind of devastating her. It's, it's you know, like there's cyberbullying, but there's, at a certain point, you know, people are going to say what they want to say on the Internet. It's one of the beauties of, of free media and free speech and, and expressing yourself. But at the same time, none of us can be blind to the fact that it does have an impact, especially when all of a sudden it's 10,000 people saying the same thing. You just feel like a bad person when you're a 22 year old girl that's had social media in her entire life. Yeah. And I um, think that that mental health is still the bigger issue and the real issue behind uh, any kind of tragic event like that. But at the same time, uh, it makes me take a more careful look at my own personal activities. And I, I'm not recommending what anyone else should do. I'm not preaching to anyone. I'm just saying after that story, I took a pretty hard look at the way I conduct myself. And I don't know that I'll completely change overnight, but I can definitely tell you that there's always a place where you can start to at least think about you know, your own actions. And I don't want to get too deep or serious, but right. Right. I, I do want to say like the first time I saw Hannah Kimura wrestle, she was eight years old and she uh, beat her mom for the DDT Iron Man open heavy metal weight championship. Uh, and so she was an eight year old champion and uh, yeah, my thoughts are with her mom right now. Cause that was her baby and they were really close and she was just 22. Uh, you know, her mom in the wrestling business as well, brought her up in the business, taught her everything that she knew. And um, they were, they were very helpful <coughs> to the Gaijin wrestlers that went over there. Um, yeah. You hear all the stories. Like uh, Thunder Rosa said some very nice things about uh, yeah. her Experiences with her and stuff and Tony uh, Storm. Um, and honestly, guys. if if you're nice to our friends, then we consider you a friend as well. And uh, the world is a lot less bright of a place without Hana Kimura's antics in it. In the the Tokyo Cyber Squad was the shit. So there you go. Well, and and in other kind of sad news, um, Shad Gaspard was another story. Um, you know, he was pretty big time when he was doing the crime time gimmick. And, um, I did not personally know him, but, um, many, many, many of our friends, uh, were very closely associated with him. Um, Jim was even at the memorial yesterday and, um, a friend of his wanted to stop by the show and kind of tell you his thoughts about Shad. You know, wrestling lost a really, really great, great guy and a really great dad this last week, Shad Gaspard. And if I could push anybody, he's got a GoFundMe page um, that is being that's set up for his son, um, Arya. And um, I'm sure the kid that his family could use the help right now. So I, I knew Shad personally. I, I wasn't his, you know, we weren't best friends, but I didn't even know him through wrestling. I knew him through the gym and our sons wrestled together. And so uh, we would sit in the the lobby of the of the wrestling club, and he would tell me the funniest stories and and the craziest stories. And he was just a really, really decent, good guy. And you know, he, he was impressive on a lot of levels. But I'll tell you, the thing that he was more than anything was an absolutely devoted father. And I always said, like, gosh, we should all be the the. I wish I had the time to be the kind of dad that Chad was, and um, and just a really, really good guy. And so I would encourage anybody you want to help his son. Um, and his his wife, uh, there is a GoFundMe page going for him, and there's T-shirts you can buy where the proceeds all go 
uh, to Chad's family and just a really sweetheart of a guy and a gentle giant and and we will all miss him terribly. Hey everyone, it's Denise Salcedo here in Lucha Central Central with a look at all the great shows available this week on the Lucha Central Podcast Network where you can find each show on its own or subscribe to the Lucha Central Podcast Network for every show in one easy feed. Just like the last two Mondays, this week we bring you the debut of one more monthly series. This one called The Business of the Business. Hosted by multi-decade wrestling writer, producer, promoter, and current Mass Republic president, Kevin Kleinrock. The series will take listeners into the inner workings of how officially licensed merchandise is made. This week on the show, graphic designer and illustrator Jeffrey Everett, who's created works for everyone from Seth Rollins to Rollins Band and from Pentacero M to The Pope. Yes, The Pope. This is a series you are not going to want to miss. Tuesday's Mats, Mask, and Mayhem takes you back inside the temple as they get inside Lucha Underground Episode 3. If you're in the United States, you can head to Tubi.tv where you can watch each episode of the series in advance to each week's MMM show. Don't miss the insider perspective from those who were there on set as the very first season unfolded. Thursday and Friday, we have you covered in both English and Spanish. First up, on Straight Out of the Bodega, Papo Esco, Gabriel Ramirez, and Kevin Kleinrock continue their conversation on a number of California scenes, wrestling promotions, and businesses. And on La Mesa de los Margaros, CMLL luchador, member of the legendary Casas family, son of Felino, Tiger Casas, pulls up a seat around the table. On Friday, the Lucha Central Podcast Network brings you Lucha Central Weekly and Lucha Central Weekly en Español. Get all the latest updates from Mexico and the most newsworthy notes on luchadores across the globe, including a look at what went down at AEW Double or Nothing and the latest on Triple A's plans to resume shows. Be sure to subscribe and follow all your favorite Lucha Central Network series on your favorite podcast platforms. And please be sure to give a rating and review to help more fans find the shows that you love. For now, this is Denise Salcedo signing off from Lucha Central Central. Have a great week. So, um, yeah, the other thing was is just passed on May the 11th was um, a year anniversary of the passing of Silver King. Um I was actually there, which was a pretty kind of horrible night and experience. But um, I think obviously most of you guys grew up with him through WCW yeah. and obviously Natural mm-hmm. Media, bro. And, and, and yeah, fucking thing. And, thing and, and yeah, dude, he was he was great. He was a great wrestler. This is today that we're filming uh, is also the anniversary of Owen Hart's death. And if you saw that... Uh, dark side of the ring uh, you can that opens up a lot of old wounds um, watching that uh, I wasn't there I do know someone that was and they were really fucked up by it yeah um, and then they went to WCW and had to watch Canyon do a fake death fall like right after that like or like a year later or something like that in the same building um, so then they never went to wrestling again after that Um, but yeah, uh, this is just a shitty time for wrestling. Like whether it's an anniversary or current events happening, it's, it's kind of a dark time. So, you know, we're going to try to look back at a happier time at a time we really enjoyed. Yes. And that's why we're going to go back and we're going to review an episode that we had a lot of fun with, uh, an episode that was a good time. We're going to try to think of the positive things for wrestling. There's a lot of negative things happening right now, and our hearts are with all the ones that are affected by that. Um, but uh, we think it's best to celebrate the things we love on this podcast, so we're going to do that right now. Yes, let's absolutely move right forward. Let's get to some great, happy wrestling news and some and a wonderful episode of Lucha Underground Season 1, Episode 3. Um, but I want to talk about one of the performers this week, you know, wrestling is super awesome. Um, it's so awesome that 
Impact decided to drop Phoenix on his head this week. What the fuck? <sighs> and, and no. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. I'm supposed to be bringing things up. I'm sorry. But I mean, dude, did you guys see dude. that? Like, I'm sitting here watching these old episodes of Lucha Underground. And then right from that, I go and turn on, you know, last week's Impact. Dynamite, I hadn't seen Dynamite, it. Dynamite, 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 Dynamite. And I hadn't seen it yet. And I see this dive and I'm just like, oh, my God, that's Phoenix's head on the concrete. What the fuck? Steve, it wasn't even a dive. He went up. He floated in the air for about or 10 minutes. You know what? And then everyone yeah. backed away. Okay, yeah. we we're not advocating the hiring of a certain peep stain, but yeah. he would have caught that. Uh, we're also not we're we're absolutely advocating the hiring of one black Taurus that would have caught that all by himself. All yeah, by just, himself. I think Steve, it's just what caught it. Well, to be fair, to be fair, Ray Charles yeah. would have caught that dive. To be fair, I think that I think Phoenix had kicked everyone around that ring, all those guys in the head before, and I think that's what they were all probably just ducking, thinking he was gonna do it again. Uh, but <laughs> come on, I mean, but it was a great match. Into, yeah, but but it's funny because you had the time to get underneath him. That yeah, but we're gonna see. We're gonna see. Um, we're gonna see uh, an episode. We're gonna talk about how we're gonna see Phoenix. Jump from the top of an office, like from a first story building, onto two luchadors. Fine, and, you know, and you compare that. Or die. It's it really was, and you compare that to this, which you know, maybe the top top Look, rope or something. I don't and, even want to. Like, I don't even want to blame it. those. I don't even want to blame those performers. I don't know. Maybe they lost them in the lights. Maybe there's something about the setup that didn't work because the the dive after that didn't go great either. It just didn't. No. Yeah, they didn't really catch anyone. So something was wrong on that side of the ring. Yeah, they the need to not was... do dives on that oh. side of the ring anymore. Show was a bit uh, snake bit also because Nyla Rose fell on Britt Baker's leg and broke oh. it. Yeah, it reminded me of that old thing in Glow with Farmer's Daughter or whatever that thing was where they showed that arm break like 72 oh. times. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. Ah, uh, God, I, I actually had that happen to my elbows. So. Oh. oh, And also, after Phoenix did his jump, and fell, and you have uh, you have someone on him the whole time asking if he's okay. They kept they had two more dives in that same spot, and they still did them. It was I was a nervous wreck the whole time. Oh yeah, like, I mean, look, oh, sometimes you have your days, sometimes you don't. That was just one of those where it was yeah. like, why why is everyone busting it this hard on the the go home show for a pay per view anyway? You're Maybe gonna have to wrestle a ladder match like soon after this too. And I know that he's not. I, and I know that AEW really wants to raise the bar to a certain extent, but you also do got to look at some of the things that WWE does. Like a go-home show, nobody gets hurt. You well, got to... Mm-hmm. Unless it's Wade Barrett. Um, well, okay. Yeah. You well, know. I've got some... Get hurt the night after the pay-per-view, like Sid. <laughs> that was... No, that, was that, that was... Uh, that was the main event of the pay-per-view. They just played oh, it, it was? right after. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. That right. It was. It was the main event. But look, he got all the way through. So anyway, we'll move on. I want to talk about Lucha Underground Season 1, Episode 3. We are going back to nice. the best of the best. And this is an episode that we're all excited about. This is an episode we were excited about when it actually happened the first time. Because this mm-hmm. is one that sees the debut of three of the bestest of the best and right off the bat you get a vignette with conan and dario talking about phoenix penta and drago coming and the best line ever is the uh i thought you were having problems with visas and conan saying no we worked that out at the border because that was oh so true at the time absolute shoot (laughs) total shoot for those who don't know those guys um There was a lot of other performers that were slated to be at least at the tapings for the first two episodes, but could not make it into America that weekend. And Lucha Underground was plagued with visa issues from start to finish. I mean, it was part of the big problem with season four. One of many. Yes. It's not, it's not but, a clown getting on, so we're all right. Oh, if I, if I look like I've been drinking blood, it's actually Kool Aid, but it's making my mouth very red. I'm just noticing it right now. Yeah, I'm not wearing okay. lipstick, I promise. All for it. I'm so excited to get through this episode because to me, this is like this episode still holds up and it and it embodies. Oh, I'm pretty excited to get about. through this episode also. Um, it's very <laughs> hot. Small bladder. Um, <laughs> I just drank a lot of Kool-Aid, bro. Like a lot. 
I mean, look, the, the, the line in this scene too, this opening vignette, the wait till you see the guys I brought from Mexico mm-hmm. meant so much to me because it was like, yeah, we got some real Lucha Libre in the first couple episodes, but mm. let's be honest. Let's be honest. Like, I love Chavo, but Chavo and Blue Demon was not what I was expecting to see yeah. when I heard the pitch of Lucha Underground. I was expecting to see some of the new breed, some of the younger guys to really kind of reinvest myself in like, what is Lucha Libre like right now? Oh, shit. Is this the episode where Chavo does the sit down interview about that? Yes, sir. Yeah. Oh, There's something so I noticed in there that is really fucking funny. There's there's a hilarious. We can talk about it right now. We can skip the first match and oh, come back okay. to it. Let's talk about it because yeah. I'll the just one that I noticed in, in order. Did you notice the, the what what I noticed was Vampiro telling Chavo that he was crazy. And I found that to be the funniest thing. <laughs> okay. Ever. That was but the I one thought, that I noticed. But I thought it was <laughs> funny. And it was right before a hard edit. So I think he might have gone a little shooty and they cut it out. Chavo calls him Blue Demon Jr. and does the finger quotes. Quote. And I'm like, oh shit. They went oh, there. Amazing. No, but he, yeah. he does that and he straight up says like he's he's coming in on his father's coattails, on his father's like, yeah, but that's after the edit. <laughs> that, that was after the edit, Byron. So that was probably like, uh, hey, let's not do that. Let's go back. Let's get a little more kayfabe here, Chavo. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> that was that was a very interesting interview to me, too. But I thought that Chavo actually sold it pretty well. And I think that he was showing that with with the promos. Um, and you, you see a couple other promos coming up in these episodes, too, that aren't on that level of like, like this is a, a made guy. This is a guy who's been through the WWE. He's been a champion everywhere. He can cut a real promo vamp knew how to work it too. I don't know what their relationship was like at the time, but you know, vamp was kind of shooting on him a little bit and, and needling him and, and it worked the style of the whole thing totally worked. I thought this was one of the better sit down interviews that Lucha's done. I thought yeah. those interviews were so cool and it sucks that they stopped doing them. Yeah. But it didn't fit Vampiro's character anymore. Once he became the master, you know? Yeah, and I, I think I think the vignettes grew into so much of a style of their own that it didn't really have a place. And let's be honest, so much of the rest of the cast was either Spanish speakers or really green. They couldn't have cut promos like Chavo did there. Mm-hmm. You know, it was Chavo and Conan that did those original sit downs, and that you know those it made sense. Yeah, and um, Paragon too did it. Yeah, so. All right, let's go back to that match real quick. Um, the first match was a, a debuting local luchador, El Mariachi Loco. Hey, from the hey. restaurant. Hey. Uh, I, okay, first of all, I love Mariachi Loco. First time I saw him was at the Anaheim Marketplace, and I think he was hurt at the time, and they were – hyping up his comeback either that or he was wrestling in one of the first matches i've seen but i'm like this guy rules he's got a cool mask with the tongue sticking out and shit (laughs) so awesome and and he's been one of my favorites since like every time i see him on a show i'm fucking happy i don't care if he's a skeleton i don't care if he's a fucking chessboard it doesn't matter He's awesome. Whoa. And, case no, space. no, I think it's, the, I think, it, look, the show is over, man. I think it's time to <laughs> expose the fact that El Mariachi Loco played, I don't know, 17, 18 different parts. What, what all parts did he play on Lucha Underground? Uh, he was, uh, he was, um, 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 Sinestro de la Muerte from the, yeah. the Disciples of Death, the one that survived longest. Uh, and he was Saltador as well. Checkers. Saltador checkers, yes, from the uh, rabbit tribe, the rabbit the, tribe, the original rabbit tribe. So he may hold the record for dying the most times on the show. That's a good point. Did they oh. all die? Well, Mariachi Loco never died. No, no, but Mariachi did- Loco won a battle royal and won fifty thousand dollars and quit. But it was like an yeah. internet exclusive battle royal. Oh. That was smart. He was the smartest one. He got out while he was still alive. Yeah, well, he's, a, he's he's he can actually go in the ring too. He's he's a better oh, wrestler yeah. than than people give him credit for sometimes, um, which is why they brought in the top caliber, a big, big performer in lucha libre for this particular match against him, Masquerita Sagrada. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and by big, we're, talking, we're talking about his dick size. I mean his heart. Uh, yeah, there well, was a little extra sewed into that that 
costume. Case you gotta, you gotta keep the clothes down. You know what I mean? But um, let, let's see. So, so Masquerita and his huge hog. Uh, <laughs> it's a legacy character. Nine hundred people played Masquerita, all of them with huge hogs, and uh, that's that's actually how you get the role. And um, I'd buy that. There, Masquerita is always one of the better workers in the minis divisions, and usually gets the gimmick because they're so great. Um, yes, a few of them are brothers, but that doesn't that doesn't preclude you from getting the gimmick. That, that doesn't mean you're gonna get the gimmick just because you're a brother. You gotta be like good. And uh, because you know, Torito used to be a Masquerita Sagrada before he became a Masquerita Dorada, before he became El Torito, before he became El Bunny. Uh, that but, is also true. <laughs> but uh, yeah, this match was great, dude. It was I, really I, awesome. Like, I think yeah. it shocked a lot of people. And, and for people who had not seen uh, a mini perform, it wasn't a minis match. It was oh. a mini versus a full size guy, which you get every now and then. But it's it's kind yeah. of rare. And it was super fun and well, well done. And I want to shout out Vampiro on commentary for having the same reactions to the match that I do while I watch it. Which is laughing every time Masquerita gets the shit beat out of him. Even though I helped, I personally helped Masquerita beat up Famous B in Believer's Backlash too by giving him football pads and That's a helmet. True. It didn't fit my yeah. head, it fit his for some reason. I don't even know why I had it. It didn't fit my head. But yeah, it's good times. Um it was a great match. I can't believe he choked out at, before the small package, uh Loco. That was I mean, it was an awesome match. You know something, Byron? That's the only time someone to use small package and masquerita in the same sentence. Oh Jesus. I quit. <laughs> are we gonna are we gonna when we rate matches also rate dick sizes of the competitors? Yep. Is that Casey? Don't, is that the new thing? It's our new system. I that's mean new system. Do you think we could get show. money out of it? Do you think we could have like the, the hogometer or something and put it on a shirt? No, I had one of those, but um Balor broke it. So, uh, uh not this big to wrestle demon. So, no, it was it was Devitt, but so that was a great match. A long time ago, that was a lot of fun. Uh, lots of high flying lucha stuff, lots of a big guy kicking a little guy in the head, and uh, it was great. And also, like, you, you started to get the energy from the crowd, and there were there were people in the crowd, yeah. It was, it was, it was starting to be, um, it was starting to be more what. You kind of are used to. I think yeah, the crowd was already into it. Vic is there in this yeah, one. And Vic Vic and Sonia teleport like two times during the match. It's really fucking weird. Well, they were sitting next to Kevin Gill, so maybe they wanted to move. I was gonna they were, it. and then they were sitting over by the office, and then they were sitting back over by Kevin Gill in the same match. I, I noticed I noticed this. We, what were you saying, me? Whoever, whoever shot this needs to less Kevin Gill. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, well, he is a giant. I mean, he's look, look. Uh, over. I was like, oh, all, all, all Kevin Gilness aside, I mean, he is a big dude, and he was sitting front row of the bleachers because he got there first that day. And Honestly, you know, I, I, blame same, him. I saw someone say the same thing about T.J. Miller in the crowd. I swear to God, they're oh, like, true. "We get it. You have famous fans. Stop showing T.J. Miller in the crowd." I'm like, "Oh, this is the most hilarious comment I've ever seen in my life." Hey, but look, the, the rules of the old temple, man, if you were the first one there and you got to walk through first, you got to sit wherever you wanted to sit. And if that's where Kevin got, that's where Kevin got. No, and he just got seats where he got them. They weren't giving him special treatment because I've no, seen no, him no. all over the temple. Yeah, He's a big I just got tired of him showing his chain and his logo off. Look, man, you got to get yourself over sometimes. You know what I mean? Ruthless if you business. If you if you had a chain from a luxurious rap company like Psychopathic Records, you'd be showing it all the time too. I'm sorry that your mixtape isn't taking off like you thought it would, but we do not need to transfer that hate onto Mr. PMA Kevin Gill unless he's doing commentary for a AAA paper. Oh, Whoa, <laughs> we don't talk <laughs> about that. <laughs> Bro, we're on LuchaCentral.com now, man. Like, real Lucha Libre fans watch this shit. We never mention that U.S. commentary from that triple mania ever again. I'm, I'm available if they want one. Please, please. So what happened home. next? So what happened next? Oh, Conan and Chavo did a little thing backstage, a little vignette. But what's, not in, what's important is not that. What's important is that it's followed immediately by Mill and Katrina. Ooh. I have oh, to say, I, I like, 
I really like when Katrina is in the vignettes. Like as much as I loved her walking past me in the uh, actual arena, something about her in the vignettes, like I, I feel like they gave her a very good treatment in all of the ones she was ever in. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, there's that. And there's also, I think just the way they, they did such a great job in establishing the intimidation factor of Mill and Katrina. And they oh, both man, have I, different... I fucked up in one of our later ones because I was shitting on the fact that Matt Stryker on commentary knew about the Pasquale Mendoza stuff, but it's in this vignette in this that, package, he, yeah. that he throws to. So he's seen the vignette. So it makes sense. So I was wrong. And I just wanted to say that for anyone going back to old episodes. Yeah, well, well, look, honestly, this has been one of the criticisms of Lucha underground. And, and when they were kind of developing the style in other wrestling, everyone fans and announcers included are seeing the backstage packages, but when they're doing a vignette of people walking through halls or something or interacting, that's supposed to be something that the, the announcers don't see. And there have been a few times when they have accidentally referenced some of that stuff that they were not have supposed to have seen. But in this particular case, you're correct, Casey, because this is not a vignette. This is a package. This is the thousand deaths of Pascual Mendoza as he was buried alive in a Mexico City earthquake and then came out and, you know, you get the stone and everything. If people ever ask where the stone came from, this vignette shows you. Um, and it doesn't get into all the mysticism yet behind yeah, the story. It not the ghost yet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, no one's teleporting yet or whatever. But this was this was probably the first segment that really set up the supernatural. Because we're saying that this guy got buried and killed, basically, in an earthquake and is now back to enact his revenge for the thousands of people that, that died with him. So this is kind of the first teaser of the mysticism and and the magical elements of Lucha Underground to me. And I'm all for it. Yeah. Also, um, and you can't blame him, but it seems like Matt Stryker went through puberty all over again when Katrina was ringside during the match. Yes. I mean, I, I kind of didn't hear him because I was too busy, you know, staring at my screen myself. But yeah. yeah. No, I'm not blaming him for it, but Yeah. I mean, but it's just, there was a lot going on. There was a lot going on. Um, Next match is um, Ricky Mandel versus Mil Muertes. I mean, I totally thought Ricky was going to go over, right? (laughs) (laughs) I think Stryker was like, I know this guy. He's really good. Oh, no. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it was like the same sentence. He hit Ricky so hard with the flatliner that it turned him into a skeleton. But it's a couple, a couple developments with Mil Moore. Um, Vampiro laughed at his pajamas. Um, and so, yeah, and so I guess they knew what they were doing, or I don't know. I mean, of course he's going to. And then also he does the, the legit flatliner, not the, the little jumpy one. Um, and he also just steamrolls dudes with his spear. Did, he's did just... you feel like there was some heat with him and Ricky, maybe? I don't know. It, it, it seemed like uh, Macias was a little stiff. No, nah, dude, it's the rule of Ricky's. You have to be nice to each other. Okay. Uh, I'll take that. Hmm? Um, <laughs> and then what, what happened after that? Oh, we went into we a, have... another vignette. Yeah. yeah. This is the mill vignette, isn't it? The this no, no, is the, the one after the, was Mundo, right? The Mundo fight scene in the hall. He takes out the uh, junior members of the crew, um, which is interesting. We're we're seeing the crew again here. They got a lot of play early in the show. Yeah, because this is when they were still like Dario's bitches, basically. Yeah, they they were literally watching the door. The the Mister Cueto isn't available right now, kind of thing. And uh, mm-hmm. Mundo handled that business, and then proceeded to make like the nicest threat to Dario. I think I've seen anyone make in the history of the series. Like Johnny is just so damn affable that the scene is still good, but it comes off a little yeah. bit weird. Once you realize that he's demanding a match with big Rick and even After I'm the- done with big Rick. Oh yeah. You're next pal. Then Which we can is- have some out together. It was pretty <laughs> funny. I, 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 I dug it. Um, and then Would you big like to surprise- come to my flying Chuck comedy show. After I finished off Big Rick. <laughs> Has anyone seen Mundo do any comedy? Like, can he do... Can John Morrison do uh, funny bits? He's, he's a funny dude. Up? 
Boone, yeah. Boone, the, Boone the Bounty. Have you not seen Russell Madness? Jesus Christ. I've seen Justin. Russell Madness and Boone. I'm talking about stand up live in front oh, of people. Okay. I mean, I, him I, and Nick are doing like short form, A form improv. We know. I don't okay. watch WWE. Products. Hey, I wasn't. I wasn't doubting it. I'm just asking. I don't know these things. I haven't seen it for myself. He's he's a good guy. I was afraid to show up because Taya wanted to kill me for a while, so I didn't. I didn't want to have heat. All right, but again, season one. This is before. Oh, well, true, true. But so, um, Prince Puma, of course, gets another package. I think in three episodes, this is literally Puma's fifth package. What, <laughs> like, yeah. we get it, we get it. Um, this guy is like overcompensation to me. Am I right? I mean, maybe. <laughs> I just thought it was kind of odd. Like, did they not have anything else? Was he really always their big push? Maybe uh, if we ever have Evie Dub on the show, we should ask him. Oh, I mean, he he had to be. But, like, if you look at all the tribe representatives, he has to be your big push. No, he was. He was a hard get for them, too. Yeah, like, I mean, it was, seemed like a big he deal. Evie Dub told us about it, Dub like, told us about it in, in MMM show episode 47. Honestly, oh, like, if you have Ricochet... He should be pushing him to the top. Yeah. Uh, unless he's Cerro Miedoing me in the face and then job him to Brock Lesnar in five seconds. Oh. oh, oh, oh. It's amazing wow. how those two things happen back to back. Like one happened because of the other. Yeah, wow. Exactly. It's like I made it happen with my mind, Byron. <laughs> it's, um, like I got a, it's like I got a writer on the inside that made that happen yeah. for me. No, but for, for, all, for all that, um, pretty much everyone says he can't cut a promo i thought he did really great with the um with the non-verbal acting on the show you know paired up with Tony, I thought that everybody, was everybody a... you really mean me right because <laughs> i am the one that will flat out say ricochet cannot cut a fucking promo i'll say it to his face i don't care i'm sure he'll beat me down for it but i don't think the guy can cut a promo he's, he's made jokes about it. i don't think he knows I mean, yeah. it's not terrible. It's workable. There's things they can do there, but he is so much better in these early episodes having Conan and having Skip produce segments for him and coming up with creative ways not to have him talk because he's not Latino. Like, it, it works so much better than even his stuff in Japan. Like, it's just better. Yeah. All it's right, great. so we got we got to talk about the most important moment of this episode, the three-way dance, triple threat, whatever the hell you want to call it, Drago, Penta, yeah. Phoenix, I will say this of these guys. I was most excited to see Drago. I uh, was a little bit excited to see Pentagon because I, I felt that he was pretty solid. I had no clue what I was getting with Phoenix. What about you guys? Uh, I liked both Phoenix and Penna. I love Drago as well, but I, whenever I would see Drago, I would be sad that he wasn't Gato ever ready because I just love that battery cat. Stupid. <laughs> Um, I would say for me, the big thing about this is um, you have those cameramen on the ring aprons, and I think that's a bad idea. And they, uh, and you could definitely tell they were union camera guys, or the guy on the apron was a union camera guy. You know what I mean? So like, right. that stopped this match. There was a corner spot, and and <laughs> yeah. that was it right there, man. They were all there, and yeah, Pentagon was like standing next to the guy on the aprons, and like you got to move. He never went back up. You Wasn't know? that another thing that happened on this AEW show? Didn't somebody this past week get flattened? One of the cameramen get flattened? I, th I think it looked like it was an on purpose thing. Uh, or maybe. I, think that, I think that was a work. Okay. Maybe. Yeah. Anyway, me, Fluff, what do you think about these three showing up in Lucha Underground finally? Well, this was kind of the first match that kind of set the, you know, the way it was going to be after this. So, like, going forward, this was the kind of action you were going to see. We saw a little bit with the Puma and Johnny Mundo match, but this was like, you know, this was giving it the soul of Lucha Libre. I agree. I mean, I feel like this was the Lucha Underground I was waiting for in general. Shit, guys, I'm sorry. I thought I had my mic on mute that whole time I was crunching ice. I apologize. No, I was eating, too. That's what I was doing. Everyone knows. I just wanted to say, Meef, with this camera, you're a very beautiful man. Yeah, it's great that you're not underwater anymore. Also, yes, if you're new, new this 
viewers of the MMM show. Uh, we are the premier wrestling mukbang podcast. So I don't know uh, what that enjoy. means. Can you explain? That's what you guys were doing. There are it's videos of people, and they're very profitable, which is what we are striving to be. Oh. I do. Uh, I do tickle fetish videos too, Byron. <laughs> so <laughs> we're blending genres. I'm gonna edit in some footage of my feet too. Oh sure. yeah, we should show our feet. That's Man, right. if you knew how much money I made off that stuff, you wouldn't be laughing, bro. <laughs> Onlyfans.com <laughs> slash Justin Harvey seventy five. Ah, uh, um, yeah, send me DMs about it because I don't get enough of those already. Um, so <laughs> six stars in the these PW. guys will know. I get. I've I'm, I've now reached the threshold with the the DMs that I get that like I'm getting asked to do some very interesting things with people that. I would never do those things with. Yeah, know. yeah. The dudes, the dudes that listen to our show are into some weird shit. I mean, oh, my God. D, my DMs are starting to look like Charlie to Melissa's page. Oh no! <laughs> Love her though. Love her. Are you going to join the Dark Order, Justin? I don't know. There is some <laughs> crazy. Um, I mean, I know she's into some kink and some weird stuff too. But like now, she's using it to promote herself to get like into wrestling companies and shit. It's like if you haven't been to Cheerleader Melissa's. Uh, Twitter or Instagram recently, do yourself a favor because there's just some things going on there that I could never explain if uh, I wanted if to. You're, if you're like <laughs> under, if you're like under 18, listen. To oh yeah, I I meant over 18. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Over 18, I mean, please. Yeah, yeah. Not safe for work. Um, so the the match itself, I, I noticed um a few things already from the first two episodes. There's more mats around the ring. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's what is, we got the name of our show. Yeah, there, which is which is kind of cool, and I also thought it was funny that um, Phoenix, when he left to go do his dive, people were mad. People thought he was just like leaving the match or something. Like, no idea the the foreshadowing. <laughs> yeah, he, he, thought he was just going home, going up the steps and leaving. <laughs> yeah, like in a re- because of the weird setup of the the. But I guess it's a good thing too because it kind of establishes in the temple that like when people go up the steps, it's not like them just leaving. Uh, honestly, yeah. though, first time I saw this match, I'm just like, where the fuck is he going? Did he yeah. just like <laughs> he just left? That was, that was one of the things. Like that was one of the things that this show, this episode established about the show. You know, among the all the other things in the action, they also established, hey, these dudes are gonna. You see, like you see the building; these guys are gonna fight and jump off everything just yeah. on a head on a swivel you're gonna see minis you're gonna see women versus men you're gonna see you know jobbers get squashed by mil muertes you're gonna see real lucha libre modern style lucha libre from these young guys and you're gonna see people take crazy dives and do things that you're not expecting and the crowd this was this to me was the first real believers crowd it was like the first few times and you can't blame anybody who was at the first few shows there were some people who were believing who were getting into it and starting kind of the the chain reaction but you started to hear the chants going this time um you you saw the crowd really getting into it vic probably had a ton to do with it i'm betting um and a few other people but you know this was the this was the first time i was watching the show and was like that crowd is fucking hot that is hype you know, how do you get to go to one of those shows? Because I had not been yet. I will never claim to be one of the day one originals. I am not. Right. I don't believe you guys are either. Um, but yeah, this was this was it. This was the start of it. So um, that was that was the episode. Um, except for one little thing at the end. We get Dario Cueto standing next to a cell and we don't exactly know what's Hell going on. In a cell. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. And it is the start of one of the longest teases in Lucha Underground history. <laughs> right here in episode three is basically the introduction of Matanza that you don't get to see for, I don't know. By anyone, Justin. Not 30. <laughs> when, when, yeah. is, when does Matanza actually show up? Like 34 episodes uh, later? Uh, so it's Ultima Lucha. No, it's uh, it, it's uh, Aztec Ultima Warfare Alpha. 2. Yeah. It's- Season two. Yeah, uh, so it's like thirty six something episodes away. <laughs> right, and when we when you see the end of season one, all they show is his eyes, and I was so fucking pissed 
this uh, I found this angle so captivating, and we kept we knew it wasn't paying off in front of us because we weren't seeing fucking Matanza. Right. He wasn't coming to the temple. No, no. But then we finally saw Matanza, and we lost our shit. And Rob Viper called me a monster for cheering him over Rey Mysterio. Oh. <laughs> I thought I thought, it was, I thought it was really fun watching a dark battle royal before uh, before they debut, and we would see um, Matanza out of costume, wrestling in the other gimmick, but doing like Matanza faces and movements. Yeah, he was he was clearly trying something out. Uh, and when we say the other gimmick, uh, we all know that uh, Cortez Castro uh, played Matanza as well, and um, which is weird. A little really? strange, yeah. Um, hey, I'm getting uh, I'm getting a message here. I think we're gonna have a special guest here in a second. Sid! Oh shit! Did you guys? It's get not. Sid? It's not. So, um, you know, I just wanted to say one thing about UFC real quick. Congratulations to Justin Gaethje on taking the interim title a couple weeks ago. Um, we haven't really had a chance to talk about it here. Um, that was a tough, tough fight for me. Uh, I did a thing with Justin Gaethje last year, and I did a thing with Tony Ferguson. Quite a while back, I shot his package for Ultimate Fighter a long time ago from when he won. I didn't think he was going to win either. I picked the other guy. I picked Ramsey Nijum. (laughs) And I've seen I've seen Tony a couple times since then, and he has not let me live that one down. So mm, anyway, but uh, congrats to Justin Gaethje. When I met him last year, he was really bumming that he could not get the Conor McGregor fight. Never thought he was going to actually find himself in the title picture. And uh, during this whole crazy scenario with Khabib and COVID and everything, he just went out on a limb, took an opportunity. I thought it was crazy for Tony to take that match, though I did think that Tony had a very good chance. Um, But Justin Gaethje just did everything right in that match. And uh, kudos to him. He guaranteed himself a match against Khabib or Conor probably, so... Yeah, he's either getting a huge payday from Connor or he's getting a shot at the belt from Khabib. Um, I think that he wants Khabib more than Connor. I think he's still really butthurt that he couldn't get the Connor fight before. So I don't think he will right. fight Connor if Khabib is available. I think that's a mistake because I think Khabib beats him and yeah. Connor doesn't. Lucha-masks.com by Pro Wrestling Revolution. Bringing you in partnership with Mask Republic. The Lucha Brothers, as well as Japanese legend Ultimo Dragon. Go to lucha-masks.com and fight Lucha Strong with masks from your favorite Lucha legends and pro wrestling revolution luchadores. Stay safe in style and represent your favorite luchador. Get yours now at lucha-masks.com, powered by Pro Wrestling Revolution. Right now, we're going to move into a segment with uh, someone who has never been on the show before that we think you guys are really going to enjoy. Yes, he's known as the man, the master, the ruler of the world, Sid Vicious. No, it's not Sid. Sid Justice? Not Sid. Psycho Sid? Not Psycho Sid. Lord Humongous? You guys, (laughs) you guys watch. Big surprise today, everybody. We have um, someone that we have wanted to get on this show for a long, long time. And you don't know Skip, but you're about to know Skip because this is one of the executive producers of Lucha Underground. And he's responsible for a whole lot of the stuff that you know and love about the show. And you think, you know, if you're a Lucha Underground fan, you've definitely seen his work. But even if you're not a Lucha Underground fan, I guarantee you've seen his work. You may not even know it. And he is one of the semi-unsung heroes of Hollywood, I'll say, because definitely plenty of people in town uh, absolutely know who Skip is and respect his work immensely. But uh, some of you might not know. But if I said things to you like the trailer for, I don't know, Mission Impossible, you, you might you might think you've seen that once or twice maybe yeah. what was it jurassic park the lost world yeah Titan- last world yeah titanic yeah wasn't that I'm, one of yours titanic I'm, I'm feeling i'm starting to feel old uh, yeah <laughs> okay yeah. a little bit newer how about prometheus one of my favorites prometheus, yeah i love yeah. that trailer mm-hmm. so skip has uh acquired a a skill through hard work, dedication, effort, uh, internships, uh, going, kicking around town, taking every project that falls into yep. his lap, of uh, being quite possibly one of the best editors of trailers ever. 
And he's also the guy that directs all those vignettes and, and behind the scenes, not in the ring stuff that everybody knows and loves from Lucha Underground. So it is a pleasure and honor to have with us today, Skip Chasen, one of the executive producers of Lucha Underground. Welcome. Yeah, Thanks, welcome. Guys. Thanks, guys. It's very nice. Thank you for that introduction. It's very, very sweet. It is nice. Thanks, guys. Well, I mean, we're, we're dude, we're fans and geeks, too. And it's like... Um, yeah. And I'm talking about the Prometheus trailer. I think that was one of the first times where I actually actively sought out like, oh, my God, who did the the, the teaser trailer or the trailer or something? I had seen it. Yeah, and I was just teaser. like, I was just like, damn, I want to see this movie. I want to know what the mythology is. You know, holy crap. You know, I, I just that trailer alone got me so damn excited. And then, you know, thank, thanks to the Internet these days, uh, got all in there. And it wasn't until... I don't even think it was until season two of Lucha Underground when Eric Van Wagnen told me like, oh, yeah, yeah. Skip Jason does all that stuff. And I was like, the trailer guy that Skip He's like, oh, yeah, he works at El Rey now and, and he's doing all this stuff. And and I did. I just during the first season, I had no clue. Oh, um, yeah. So They're really busy. Yeah. I, I, I got to ask, like we'll start with lucha underground like how did the lucha underground thing fall into your realm in your sphere yeah it was um uh, well let's see a, a lot of stuff was happening at that time we were getting ready to launch el launch el rey and um i'd known robert through features uh and um feature advertising work and uh he brought up we were just really talking about el rey and um that at there is it, there is a mission to the channel to promote diversity in in, in front of and behind uh, the camera and and not just like clip service just it, it's telling stories that uh, can re appeal to a, a broad audience. Um, you know, Lucha Underground is really a, a testament to that. Uh, and also, Ellery started on um, genre love. You know, uh, so it was like Robert's playlist and Quentin's playlist of like cool stuff. And um, when you start up a, a cable channel while you're in production on original things, you still have to put stuff on the air. Like, you know, it, it's there's right. a timing aspect to it. And so what became um, like cost effective, we thought as Robert says, you know, something that's a negative, you can turn that around to be a positive. And it turns out that stuff that was inexpensive and was able to, to be gotten and put on the air was stuff that just, you know, people weren't searching out a lot of grindhouse stuff. Um, the Shaw brothers library, um, uh, a lot of that kind of stuff, uh, um, uh, science fiction stuff, um, action stuff and, and everything that we liked, um, that helped populate the channel. And we were talking about all this cool stuff that was coming up, Dust Till Dawn, Lucha Underground, Matador, all this stuff. And um, for when we had discussions about Lucha Underground, and it wasn't called Lucha Underground at first. Um, there was a lot of different luchas, luchas here, lucha there, you know, domination, all, all kinds of stuff. But at its core was um, a love of where I started watching wrestling was in the old WWF days where it was Sergeant Slaughter and um the british bulldogs and uh mr side uh, mr ito i can't remember um rocks uh Dwayne's dad yeah um all those things that i grew up in that lore and my dad we lived here in los angeles when we lived here um we would go to the olympic auditorium and see oh, yeah. those things and and i always liked the atmosphere of the olympic the lighting of the olympic Eve, that you know st stayed with me even just as a, a little kid and um, when we were talking about Lucha, that was part of the, the flavor was, well, okay, so they're wrestlers and they have this big, lo this lore. And as a kid, they were superheroes. So I thought, oh, okay, let's lean into that. That's, that's where it is. Let's bring those things to life. And where other promotions would have um, backstage vignettes, the lore wasn't really touched upon nowadays. It, it was more the you know the relationship to the crowd to get pumped up and then what storyline was going but their backstory whatever that may be backstory motivations really became like with the previous week or the previous match or the previous thing not the historical aspect of it um or the historical bad guy versus good guy the evil thing you know there was the face and everything else but it wasn't like sergeant slaughter i figured 
okay, he really was in the military, you know, all that stuff. I, I had that feeling. And, and, um, uh, I forget who it was, um, Sergeant Slaughter versus the, um, was it Khomeini? I can't remember. Um, oh man, it was, but he had his villains and, but there was always a motivation and I felt like they were in a universe, even right. though they were all different characters. Uh, they felt like they were in the same crazy universe and that was out there. And as a kid, I just felt like that was out there. And when I was young, we didn't have the benefit. We had comic books. Um, and so it was up to us to read those comic books and to bring those things to life through our imagination. And so the one thing that was on TV consistently, other than Batman, Batman had his universe, but was wrestling. And um, that universe was brought to life. Uh, so that was a really, you know, I, I was still into comic books, but that was something that was coming to life at that time. Around that same time period, um, I don't know if you remember, uh, there was a, uh, a, a sizzle reel that was done for a, a, a concept of Mortal Kombat. And it took uh, Mortal Kombat to, uh, it had Michael Jai White in it, and it was just grungy as heck and super violent. And you had the legacy stuff, uh, right? Yeah, even before legacy. It was like, oh, yeah, that's what got it, legacy made or something like exactly, that. Exactly, or, or put yeah. it in the pipeline. Um, it was probably like four minutes long or something. Uh, heavily produced. Um, the kills were awesome. I mean, it was just, yeah. it, it was great. It was, it, it was cinema. And so I, uh, when Robert asked me about it, I just thought, well, what would my Robert end now? Um, when Robert said, Hey dude, go for it. Um, let's, let's see what we can do with this and, and, um, to raise it up. Uh, and so everything that we do at El Rey is we look at it through a cinematic lens. And I, when I talked to, uh, Eric, uh, DJ and Roach, I mean, they're all about uh, elevating and putting stuff cinematic wise and looking at it from that theatrical lens. Um, and uh, uh, what they were writing, rather than just have people refer to things in a locker room, I started to think, well, oh, yeah, we could bring that to life. Like, all right, mm -hmm. let's, let's bring that to life. And um, let's see where the audience, if the audience will stay with us. When so we we didn't just really start out with Drago breathing fire, you know, it took a little <laughs> while to to get there. And um, the first, like, see what fantastical is thing, you know, what's what's that about? And that was getting all the partners on board as well, right? Um, and <laughs> There's always that. <laughs> yes, and what that was, what I did was, um, you know, part of what I would do to help people get their movies started or to help studios. Uh, really see or get a feel for what the director is talking about. If there's a pitch, I would create these um, sizzle reels or rip matics We call a bunch of different things. In commercials, it was rip matics For features, I started doing them. Um, and uh, so I shot some stuff, got some other stuff together, and just created a little feeling of what a vignette could be. And that was one of the things that really coalesced everybody. Like all the partners and everything were like, oh yeah, okay, that's where we're at. And that really started to push everybody forward. I'm not taking credit for it. It was just everybody had their vision and they wanted to see something, but they uh, they were all describing it separately. And when I, I came in, I came in after the fact, like later on in the process, um, all the negotiations and everything. And so I came in towards the end just before we got that go. And so I was able to hear everybody and go, oh yeah, okay, I'll just cut a little sizzle. But it really helped people go, oh, okay. Um, and then uh, – Well, seeing is believing. I mean, you, get that, yes. you get that thing in front of people. And, you know, we talk about the business side of Lucha Underground a lot on this show too. So we mm -hmm. we completely understand how many voices are in the room. It's, it's a show yeah. with a lot of chefs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they all – you know, it can uh, – when you hear, you know, the kitchen's got too many chefs in there or too many cooks in the kitchen – I always look at it. Now, this is now this is something you bring from the trailer world. If you imagine a passionate filmmaker, passionate producer, um, also uh, studios with the best intentions, and then there's the studio head, and then there's the mark, head, head of marketing who also answers to all these different voices. It's easy to think of everybody as being negative against each other, but really they all want the best. And if you can look back and hold your spirit and go, okay, I understand this is a little crazy, but everybody's just looking for the best product. They want to do the best thing or tell the best story. And so that was the mindset that I brought into Lucha. And that was almost 
super needed, um, which was that person who was, it's almost a consigliere, like from the Godfather. Right. But, uh, <laughs> but it's also somebody who listens and goes, okay, uh, uh, this is what we can do for this. This is what we can do. For, I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. Now let's, you know, uh, let's put that together. Um, and uh, I think that was, that helped. That helped a lot. Because so the- then it, yeah, it has helped a lot. The, the style was kind of, to me, especially, and, and we're re-watching right now the first season because we're kind of talking oh, yeah. about those early episodes on this podcast. And I'm, so I've been, I've gone back and seen some of those early vignettes again. Mm-hmm. And it feels like a little bit like uh, you got a little El Santo movie yes. vibe in there, crossed with a little bit of Robert's yeah. Dust Till Dawn thing and maybe Absolutely. some Bruce Lee kind of action Yep. Oh, which we, which I can't wait until we get to the Pentagon stuff again with the breaking oh, yeah. the arms and leaving oh, we're, the, yeah. we're totally, we're yeah, totally, and, and, and I, I want to ask you specifically stuff, yeah. about that one, but yeah. because, because those, those, those made the man's career basically. Well, like, yes, hmm. for sure. But, but in those, in those first few vignettes, like, was that the style you were going for? Were you trying yeah. to bring in those elements or did it yes. just happen that way? Yeah. And it wasn't, it wasn't just me pulling, I, I, after I talked to wrestlers, one of the things that I really, it was enjoyable for me, all of them had this huge love for Bruce Lee and Bruce Lee movies, like each and every one. And that was almost a unifying understanding for everybody. Cause you had people, um, it, not just a language thing, but as you know, you know, in Mexico city, it's not just like, Hey, just because you're in Mexico City it means you agree on everything, or you're just of one mind. Right. Uh, it's like, okay, I'm from California, so all you guys must think the same way. No, um, there's a lot of different opinions and and variations of dialect and things. But I have to say, the unifying element was Bruce Lee. Um, everybody immediately got behind that, and so um, from an action standpoint, I we would take that. I took that as a core, and then threw in the signature live action move from everyone that we could do um, or that we could throw in into that mix. Uh, And the reason why I started with the martial arts thing was because it helped people understand the necessity of playing towards the camera and the difference between plays playing towards the camera and the wider stage audiences. If you were in a stage play, Um, that was a big translation thing that for everybody. And then even from how to, how to make a fist, um, on film versus in the ring, you know, hold the egg when you're in the ring on film, make a fist. Um, right. Those little little things that you're like, oh, uh, uh, that they were just learning or uh, and it wasn't even just learning, but realizing a lot of it was realizing. So between that, I would use um, for style and, and mood, I'd cut together each little sizzles or scenes for everyone. And sometimes it wasn't it's not just for action. Like with uh, Luis and um, Conan, one of the very first scenes that we shot is dialogue-wise. Um, I showed them the diner scene from Heat, and that was that. Even just saying, "Okay, you're De Niro, you're Pacino," automatically gave them confidence. They understood performance. And they understood, "Oh, I'm not just standing in a parking lot yelling at somebody. Somebody's really think I'm really taking this seriously." And then they immediately they change their dialogue and how they wanted to learn their dialogue and how those beats were. If I'm comparing them to something that Michael Mann did and then using the same kind of camera moves, they started to get that. And so then everything, all these scenes, if you look at all those scenes, they're all homages and they're homages from love, but also because stuff I showed them, look guys, it's going to be like this. It's going to be like this. Um, Or this is what we're going for. And it automatically gave them a sense of pride and excitement. Um, and uh, so, and it, you know, uh, it, it was nothing on me. It was just, I'm using, Hey, I'm using the great works of other people to say, okay, right. so um, Pentagon, this is Toshiro Mifune. Here he is in seven samurai. Look at how he's standing. Look at how he's walking. Look at how he does. He doesn't talk. And cause he was concerned. He, he had a, he was coming off uh, in season one. You guys more know more than me. He, had, he was coming off a really serious back injury. Um, and uh, his l- movement was limited. So he was concerned. He was like, this was a great example that we're turning him into this huge martial arts master. Um, but his movements, it was tough for him. To, it was frustrating for him too, because he could do a lot of stuff, but it was just painful for him. And there was, he needed to have an economy of movement. And so I showed him 
Seven Samurai, a scene from Seven Samurai, and um, Clint Eastwood uh, to accept that economy of movement, but still portray that badass thing while he was healing. So you can see, you'll see as, as season one goes along, like uh, how he moves. And then ultimately, you know, once you get to two or three, where when, when do we, he really went over, um, like he was feeling his oats and, you know, he was end really, of two, basically. yeah. And end of two. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, but anyway, th those were little tricks. And so, well, I mean, in case you brought it up, stuff, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. We, we got to ask you about the Pentagon thing, because I, I, you may not accept credit for this, but I think that that us as well as EB Dub and DJ and a lot of other people will give you the credit for part of really what got Pentagon over, which was the arm breaking thing. And the guy is a superstar now yeah. because of it. And honestly, you are really kind of responsible for that. So where did that come from and how did it branch mm. into the ring? I mean, it was it was a huge, huge thing. Well, it was a discussion. Thanks for that. I can't say I, I I can't take full credit for that. He he sold it over. Um, but what the it was a discussion between um, uh, our I I, <clears throat> I brought on a good friend of mine. Um, and uh, 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 we could just call him Sifu Ray. Um, and he was the martial arts, uh, uh, kind of stunt advisor in there. And so Ray and I were talking about so, um. Pentagon is a master of all the mystic arts, you know, or sorry, mystic martial arts. It's, it's, you know, not just straight up martial arts, but mystic martial arts. Um, and so I thought I, I wanted to put him in something that was like a game of death. Mm -hmm. Oh, I just lost you. Are you guys hearing? Yeah. Hey, yeah. Um, uh, just in, okay. just in DC, um, a little bit. Oh, okay. Um, but anyway, so, uh, you know, his set is reminiscent of a game of death and his origin story um, that has all the different uh, martial artists from different styles um, is reminiscent of Game of Death, Bruce Lee's Game of Death. And so uh, if he was ultimately a master, we wanted to relate that to um, ending up in the ring, which was wrestling, which was um, uh, jujitsu uh, and um, the arm break. And mm -hmm. so uh, that it, the arm break, putting him on the floor. So he fights, he fights a Wing Chun guy. He fights a Taekwondo guy. He fights a Muay Thai guy. All these things that he eventually sees, and this is very deep. But you know, whether you see it or not, it's, it's, this was my thought process: was those different martial arts were chosen? Even the Praying Mantis guy were chosen because all the opponents that he would see in the ring later, if you're watching those vignettes, you'll go, "Oh, that's so and so. That's so and so. That's so and so." I was taking different arts. From there, knowing that that one move or that one move might happen later. And so it gave the audience this kind of a subliminal callback to like, oh, I've seen him do this. I've seen him do this. The one thing that went way over was the arm bar because we finished the sequence with that. Um, and the the yeah. leaving the martial arts masters in the shape of a pentagon with their dead yeah. bodies on the floor. The absolutely head. tremendous. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Loved it yeah. so much because yeah. he is my favorite wrestler right now. And he has yeah. been since Lucha Underground. And that vignette is one of the things that made him my favorite wrestler. It was really fun to shoot. That was really, it was, um, uh, it was, it, it was fun to, it was fun to shoot. It was interesting. And uh, I just, I wish he'd been able to enjoy it a little bit more, but he was in a lot of pain. That guy, man, what a trooper. As as you guys know, wrestlers are freaking troopers. They mm -hmm. they yeah. go through pain just daily. And, um, you know, we're asking him to do a lot of stuff. And they're getting used to – this was a big thing, especially in season one, was wrestlers getting used to doing multiple takes. Usually they just – like. One and done, I'm out there in front of the audience. I got to land it or not. If it's a mess up or whatever, I got to roll with it. We're here. It's I'm asking them to do it, you know, over and over. I don't know how many times I had Puma flip, you know, just so I could cover all these angles. It works great. But, um, yeah, with uh, with Penta, that was just, was, that was, uh, it was tough. He, he, man, he struggled. He went through it. He made it through, especially. And then, um, uh, you know, if, uh, telling wrestlers to sell a move or to sell a look, and that's second nature, and that's where they really enjoy it. So, um, you know, with the different beats and everything, and we had timings of, like you guys remember there. So there's a Pentagon. So then part of that, all that stuff for the Pentagon is the number of uh, uh, candles we have around, we had around in his dojo. 
Uh, and so then we had different angles of, okay, he's going to kill this guy, but when he kills him, we're going to rack focus and poof, blow out the candle as he kills the guy or he, as he takes his soul, as he takes his soul. So it goes boom, 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 boom. And then the last one was, um, when he's sitting and he really is a cell and we push in, um, and he, he does a sign. It's just that that was really fun. That was really absolute, fun. absolute gold. But the, yeah, my favorite really, segment in wrestling history. Yeah. But it wasn't it yeah. I, I didn't think, okay, this is going to be your signature thing. We just thought, oh, this is, he really knows how to do it. And um, it's a good thing. It's you, shooting an arm bar cinematically. You, all, you always have, especially if it ends up in a break, you can get, you get the, the audience immediately cringes, you know, and it's a good thing mm -hmm. to, to cheat that move. But, it you know gets people every time. I mean, and it got him over, over so much that he, now he's in AEW. They haven't even tried to go duplicate that vignette because oh, they, they, are they doing vignettes? I didn't even know. Uh, not really. No. no. And they, some of them, some of them, like Darby Allen will shoot his own stuff. There's a couple. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah but, most of the vignettes uh, are shot by the like, guys. But it's a lot of like new guys who need yeah. to bring up the characters, like the first season of Lucha. But they haven't done anything with Pentagon. I don't think they've really needed to introduce him at all. Well, yeah, they don't well. need to at this point. I mean, I feel right. like, we and that's the thing. I mean, he left when, when Lucha Underground ended, he was able to leave there and just instantly be the top draw on the indies. Mm -hmm. I mean, instantly. And then yeah. he's doing stuff with Impact or even when he was going back to AAA, like any yeah. place he walked into, he went from being a, a low mid card guy in AAA, came to Lucha Underground, got the arm break thing, went, completely over mm -hmm. um and and was huge and all of a sudden you know the guy leaves there and 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 you know there's these there's these moments where where stars transcend where they might have been a big name like like triple h he was a big guy when he was in De degeneration x but he wasn't the triple h we know today and then you know he does the mick foley thing and he's throwing mick foley through cages and stuff and all of a sudden there's that career defining moment and for the rest of time, he's this yeah. bigger level guy. Yeah. And for Pentagon, that moment was simply in that vignette, breaking an arm. And all of a sudden, you know, that created a trajectory for, for him as a wrestler, mm -hmm. uh, Luchador, that is is unheard of a lot of times for the guys at this level. A lot of other guys had had big moments, but weren't able to transcend like he was. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he that, was, he was that, 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 um, yeah. The, uh, the master storyline too was like one of the first really meaty storylines and as a fan uh getting used to lucha underground's presentation you know one of the things you talk about is they they deliver where a lot of wrestling doesn't and so there's this big master storyline and the longer it goes like the more exciting it gets what's it who's it going to be what's it going to be and there's there's just so much i remember his first submission match against sexy star where she was still oh, face yeah yeah katie yeah. and i were the only ones in the crowd yelling our heads off for him to break her arm the whole night. <laughs> and then lo and behold, that was a shock. I'm sure Eric and the boys said that too. It's like, whoa, they're like it. Okay. Well, let's go with it. You know, that's the beauty that that is I, I have to give, you know, with uh with DJ and Roach is you for series television, um, and you're reacting to fan reactions kind of, kind of, kind of, but it's a long time for feedback. And then over time, then it's you have to, you know, coalesce an amount to justify, you know, maybe we're going to turn him this way. But it's almost always an, an internal discussion with uh, a lot of execs that are reacting to um, testing and everything, which there's good and bad. And then there's there's even interpolation and testing. But um, not unlike a trailer that you get an audience, you have a, a captive audience and there is specific reaction. Um, that lot, those live things there, there, Chris and, um, DJ are, were able to react and modify stories right then. Okay. Who's going over? We know, oh, they're starting to track. All right, let's modify this. That's a oh, incredibly hard thing to do. I know it is, it's somewhat commonplace in, in wrestling just to track and see who's going to go over and who's this and to modify. But, um, but I mean, that's part of how we do. Yeah. That's part of how we even got to know them because yeah. they would come out and talk to us. And, yeah. you know, given Byron and I have a, a TV background in production as well, and I know a 
ton of the same people from reality. And so does Byron and Casey's, you know, got a, a master's in, in screenwriting and whatnot. So mm-hmm. we, we were good wrestling fans for them because we understood their language. But at the same time, they were just coming to us because they saw us as guys who were popping in the audience and other people yeah. as well. Yeah, and we were we the crazy started... Ultima Lucha Pentagon, Pentagon fans with the signs. That was us. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, hey, the believers. Yeah, K- Casey was also in a match. Don't let him fool you. Oh yeah, I was one of the believers. Oh. Backlash guys. Yeah. Backlash. Oh wow. Oh, that was crazy. Wow. Yeah, that was that was yeah. good times. Yeah, that was. And but the, I the, 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 oh yeah, I remember. Oh, that the instant funny. feedback though, and and their inclusion of of that instant feedback. I mean, we saw it. Like we've all seen yeah. things that we've said, or somebody else that's a friend of ours that's a believer has said to them end up in the show or and not just end up in the show the way that we said it either or what we'd like to see because dj and roach especially are just sick sadistic dudes so they'll take your idea and just turn it on its head completely and do the most outrageous version of it um a lot of times but it was a lot of times they'll pull that wish master shit on you where it's be (laughs) careful what you wish for yeah well i can say uh, geez, I can't remember if it was season one or two. When did the Nunchuck match happen? Nunchucks um, was oh, two, was that, I believe. Was it two? It was, um, and that spun off of, well, okay. So we had this thing where, um, uh, you know, Drago was getting attacked in the bathroom because that was like a deadly bathroom. Stuff was always going down in there. <laughs> the yeah. meanest bathroom in Boyle Heights. Yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> and, um, and uh, Drago was, he was really good. He was a guy that was, that was one of the first things I saw of him was, wow, I realized like, oh yeah, he's, he's really confident with a pair of ninjas. Um, And then the nicest guy in the world. Um, and so I said, well, okay. Uh, again, we're all Bruce Lee fans. And I said, well, in Game of Death, there was one Nunchuck versus one Nunchuck. If we're going to do Nunchucks, we got to, we got to up to ante. So, um, and then Jack Evans, a great martial artist in his own right. Says, oh, okay. So there, and then, um, I think we had dare wolf. So then it ends up like being three noon chucks or, you know, two versus one. And that day, once we figured it out, I said, okay. Um, you could see as we were shooting, cause we would shoot just the, the shoots were really crazy. So we'd have one scene and then prepping for another scene while another scene's going on. And so it's just a round Robin. So while, um, we're shooting another scene. I could take a break and walk out and I'd see the guys in the temple, different parts, all with pairs of new chucks. And so it just became more and more and more in the same. And, um, uh, let's see, before I implemented it, I just, I had the idea, uh, asked Eric and everybody and he went like, Oh, okay. We didn't think about it. That's great. The, the wrestlers got into it. Next thing you know, um, Aerostar's coming back from the future and he has two glowing new chucks. Uh, yes. and so it was just, yeah. And that was like, Kelly and props. I mean, so I was like, okay, so if he's coming from the future, he's going to be at night. Let's have something in the glows. And so she pauses. All right. And then she goes and comes back. And then next thing you know, we've got these two things. And the thing with Aerostar, he'd never picked up one new chuck, let alone two. So that day, Ray, uh, our, our advisor was working with him as was everybody else. And so it was just like the noon chuck day. And then that leads to actually having new chucks in the match with an audience out there. That was, that was crazy, but it just I started. Love, I have a little crazy. bit of a story of the noon chucks match that you might not have seen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So I got made fun of this for probably the rest of my life, but there's a there's yes. part where they're brawling on top of Dario's office. Of yeah. Okay. And the noon chucks fall off by accident and they land right at my feet. So what would you do then if they landed at oh. your feet, Casey? I would pick them up and throw them to the good guy, Drago, you would right? Throw oh. them to him, correct? Um, <laughs> it went right over Drago's oh head and into Jack Evans's hands. And oh. So, oh, that's great. Yeah, so they on commentary, yeah. Matt Stryker's like, why did that fan just throw those nunchucks to Jack Evans of all people? I'm like, oh, oh. So funny. <laughs> oh man, so classic. You in space. Oh, so awesome. we skip, right, yeah. well, I, I got to talk to you a little bit about the trailer thing because it's so oh, okay. applicable in this world, because what, what we figured out over time is that you are the perfect guy to literally be able to, I, I won't say mimic, but um, embody another director's style at any point in time because you've dealt with all of them you've dealt with spielberg the blessing of, both uh, the scots yeah. bruckheimer yeah. man de palma like 
literally a ridiculous john woo didn't yeah. you do some trailer stuff for, for yeah. mission impossible 2 for john, john was I mean, awesome yeah and then we ended up doing stuff for him for um, this bmw camera uh, oh what a sweetheart guy for doing so much mayhem mayhem um the nicest man i mean oh he was awesome john was awesome so the the one that strikes me the most is um, the Gone in 60 Seconds, because I think this oh, okay. is a perfect um, kind of testament to your skills of you get a little bit of raw footage or whatever, but then you have people from the office and whatnot, like, yeah. cut it, like explain that to me and yeah. what you did, because I feel like Lucha Underground is the same thing. It's like, here's yeah. a bunch of raw goods. Now make it and make it in this style so that we can all be happy and love this product. It's... um. Oh, it's so funny. Uh, well, lots of times in trailers, as an indie filmmaking, if you think of trailers, I, I came to think of trailers as indie filmmaking. Before I was doing trailers, I was doing a lot of other stuff in the industry. Um, and at that time, um, a lot of commercial production and music videos, um, and especially music, music videos, limited budget. And um, during that time, not that that was a specific time where everybody wanted something different. If you shot it, everything was shot on film. And even just in the transfer, even in the color correction, everybody wanted something different. Step on the negative, throw some dirt on there. Let's film roll it, roll it backwards and forwards and over process, cross process. All that, that was commonplace. And I kind of adapted that language. And um, when I started doing trailers very early, I think one of the first ones I, I worked on, didn't do it solely, was um, uh, Natural Born Killers. And Natural Born Killers was cross-processed and overlays and all this in, in, in super rich colors. But it was also, um, what did uh, uh, Oliver Stone at the time, he said that his, the editorial that I, he was looking for was subliminal editorial to get the um, subtext of the character across. So wow. now when you watch that movie. <laughs> that's deep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, now that seems crazy. But now if you watch that movie, um, stuff would be going and cross cutting and everything in the middle of dialogue or something, but that's really what's going on in the. He was saying that's what's going on in that character's thought process, um, and so so I thought, okay, that was really interesting. And then, uh, you know, other trailers later, other storytelling things later, because I was blessed with being able to go. Okay, so sometimes I would do the trailer, sometimes I'd do the teaser in the trailer. Um, then it would be the main title sequence or a sequence within the movie. Um, because lots of times with trailers, people are getting dailies as the thing is shot. And um, many times you don't even have a cut of the movie, even a string out. When I call a string, you guys have a string. Yeah. Um, even where the basic story, basic, basic story is laid out, you don't have that. You have a script, and oftentimes that script, and you know, it, it, sometimes it's not even a shooting script, or it's just the script just before the shooting script. So you're tasked with interpreting what the heck is going on from hours and acres, it can be acres. I'm not exaggerating, acres of footage. Right. Without the benefit of maybe the benefit of having one discussion with uh, the director or two discussions because they are under the gun because of time. It's all time and money. Um, so your interpretation, sometimes it's you're not called upon to tell the whole story, which in my opinion is the best thing about teasers and trailers. When you're not telling the whole story, you're giving a vibe, you're giving a feeling. Prometheus gives a vibe and a feeling. Um, and sometimes, you know, the story isn't told till later when people get all this footage in. And it's necessity because you only have a certain amount of things. We've gone in 60 seconds. I had a couple car chases, had a couple of cool lines from Nicolas Cage. Thankfully, I had cool lines from each person. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> you know, enough. Cool lines from each person. And then things we didn't have, um, as an independent filmmaking, like, you know, somebody screaming as a car goes through a glass window, that's me screaming. Or, um, you know, it's... Uh, the new the Wilhelm, right? <laughs> Skip is the yeah, new yeah. Wilhelm scream. Uh, I'm going to find that and I'm going to use it forever, Skip. It's in there. Oh! Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, Angelina Jolie, she yells and laughs, but we don't have that. So it's somebody, it's the receptionist, you know, or, or something like that. That would happen a lot. It still does. Um, uh, but um, with that, what did we do? Uh, it was, it, it, that could have, we were fans of the original. That was a big thing. Um, and around that time, I had just learned basic, basic, basic Photoshop skills and how to implement, implement that into 
cutting film. And that was really a big thing. Uh, I mean, huge thing. Now it's like commonplace and Adobe Photoshop and all this stuff. Um, it's, it's, an, it's just there. Right. Um, doing something like that then, not to my testament, it was just we're learning technology as it goes. And, hey, it's in the middle of the night. We don't have graphics. Um, oh, I know how to do a graphic. So I do that graphic. So if you watch Gone in 60 Seconds, it's like the same graphic trick over and over again because it was the only thing I knew how to do. Uh, so what we did was, um, you know, i big fan of drive-in movies. I had a drive-in movie book um, and uh, just a big fan of movies, movie going experience in general. So I had books of stills that were um, – public domain. And so I shot those kinds of things. We scanned them in um, with some other overlays. And it took at the time, which was the beginning of with just the small amount of footage. At that time, it just looked like a regular car chase thing, not a full flesh thing. Nothing right. against the director. They're in the middle of shooting. They don't have all the meat, you know? Right. So, They're just sending you dailies basically, right? Yeah. Dailies and um, not all their best dailies, you know, cause they're, they're in the middle of shooting. It's what you got. So um, between that and a couple of fun pieces of music and playing with a logo, as so you can see, there's a lot of manipulation of the Jerry Bruckheimer logo. Right. A couple times in that trailer. Yeah. That's because we didn't have a lot of footage. <laughs> so I did have the logo and I knew the logo and uh, Jerry was cool with me messing with it. So well, and he was big time then too. So that logo actually got people excited. I mean, yeah, I that loved a, that trailer. That was, brand. that was a brand. And then, yeah. the big, then I don't know if people had really messed with a logo at that time period. So that was a, out of necessity. And so with sound effects and, you know, to the road down to Jerry's tree from his, you know, uh, from his farm uh, became a race. Uh, and um, so, you know, I, I think it was Confunction. Uh, I, I, I grown up with that song and stuff. And um, so anyway, it was just a ride and very basic one note stories. What's the idea? What's the core idea? um uh 50 cars 24 hours something well, it's, it's genius know. it's a genius trailer too because it doesn't have to be the movie it has to make you want to see the movie and right. represent what the movie's about and i give think the you flavor did, of it give you did capture that it gave you the flavor and i was like yeah. oh this is a badass remake i actually yeah. want to go see this now um and i won't say i won't mention any specific movies here but a lot oh, of times you yeah. One of the Go things ahead. that was uh, sorry. One of the things that was at that time period. I didn't right around that time. KROQ was huge, still huge. You know, it's 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 its thing. It's it, but that was huge, and they would um, manipulate sound. They would manipulate their voices in their promos, in their promos. So they would put a phone a futz on the voice and repeat the voice and do something else. And I said, you know, everybody's hearing that now, but they're hearing it on the radio, and KROQ was. Not just an old guy liking stuff. Then it was like the height of young. Right, it was it was the hype stuff right there. Yeah, that that was young and alternative. Um, and so I was listening to that, and I was like, man, I, I'm liking it because it's neat. Um, and so uh, one of the voices on there was a female voice, and in their promos, just in back there, because KROQ KROQ at that time was just you know, there was a cool thing and then a sexy thing and then this and that overtly, blah, 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 blah. So I thought, oh, this is really dope. And um, uh, how did I, you even get away with getting a woman in there and, and some of the sexy stuff in the trailer too? Because there, there's yeah. a couple of really suggestive lines towards yeah. the end that were not done yeah. in trailers back then. No, no, no. Either we thing. Crossed, we crossed all kinds of lines. It was like an L. Ray trailer back in the day. Like L. Ray <laughs> breaks all the rules. Um, but, uh, but anyway, that was, I, I can't remember what I'd done something with Melissa and she was just awesome. And I was thinking, man, as soon as I can, I'm going to find an opportunity to put this because nobody else now, again, it was gone to 60 seconds, a remake, but around that time period, I forget what huge movies were coming out that had branding attached. So I was trying to think of just anything. What's different? What's going to cut? What's going to set, set us out? Well, there's all these other macho things. Let's put let's put M Melissa's voice in there, and then I'll repeat it. Um, uh, it was just that was creating a music video and the storytelling of it, and everybody like uh, again, it wasn't just me sitting in a vacuum. Just imagine the the I'm going to say the balls of people at Disney. This was Touchstone to Disney. Disney doing this kind right, of Right. I believe me. I get it. Yeah, it's crazy. And, yeah. And um, Oren and I think Dave Singh, these two guys, it's great. They said, let's 
go. I mean, the weight on their shoulders. Forget it. I just can't. I, I really yeah. just can't even believe you just didn't get a firm no and just have to go back and recut was, it immediately. Those guys were like, "Okay, let's go." That you know, <laughs> testament to them. They were like, "Yeah, all right, that sounds good. Let's go for it." And Absolutely was, yeah. amazing. If you guys liked that, be sure to come back next week for part two, where um, Skip Sid is going to. Skip is going to talk about oh so much more Lucha Underground stuff and maybe even another special guest in addition to that. So make sure you guys come back next week. Make sure you rate, review, subscribe, like, thumbs up, all that crap. And remember, until next time, stay calm and stay in the mix.